Yeah, I, I have a small minor marketing question, Pear. <laughs> when you put up your slides, which you have shown on the web, yes. it's basically dead meat. If you put them up with a video of you and the whole, what should I say, the whole uh, full steam behind it, uh -huh. you are ignited by the idea, uh -huh. and then you use the slides, uh -huh. then I think you will get much more mileage. If you do a questionnaire with your Copenhagen students, and if you speak in the microphone, your communication works. Yes. Okay. <laughs> if you. Uh, do a questionnaire for your Copenhagen students, um, it's that meet again. If you have a short video clip and someone saying this is the best thing since sli sliced bread was invented, uh -huh. I think that would be great. So I would like, if you're not doing that already, to encourage you in using video in order to get the message on the web as well, uh, perhaps as otherwise, why perhaps video tape a student group whilst they're doing it and then cut it together in a very small piece that might yeah. give much more life and soul to the whole idea than just empty slides. Well, you know, a lot of my communication <laughs> skills I learned from you. And we're doing, we're doing exactly what you're saying. The, the, the PowerPoint slides are, are part of seven videos where you actually see a little picture of me. But you can kind of, if you don't want to see me, you don't have to. But but that's exactly what we're doing. And then I'm talking and, and the PowerPoint slides are coming up. So, so we're doing exactly what you're suggesting. Uh, that's no coincidence, I'm sure. Uh, what we're going to do in the evaluation um, beginning this fall, we're going to use eye clickers. Eye clickers are these remote control things and uh, you can then vote for whatever, one out of five choices or whatever, and it comes up on the screen. You, you use those at if free, right? Okay. So we're going to use those. So we have instant evaluation of whatever we want to use. Um, I haven't used those before because I, was, I, I had a bad experience in Copenhagen um, when we evaluated the students' presentations, but on paper. And then the next day, since this was a total immersion course, the next day uh, I would bring in the results in um, uh, on a PowerPoint slide on a bar diagram. And there was a group of students that did very poorly. And the other students told them that in no uncertain terms. And they went into a kind of depression. So I decided that was a little too rough on them. But I'm going to try it again and, and see if it works for Cornell students. But yeah, very good point. Thank you. Oh. There are evaluation forms on the chairs. <laughs> I yeah, think no you introduced that pair. You introduced that to IFPRI, I think. Probably. I didn't. <laughs> Probably um, did. Suresh, um, um, uh, in a moment I want to give you the microphone and speak to two things. One is the potential links to the Open University Agrokuri and maybe a comment on impact, but first the microphone right there. I'm Ellen Messer. I'm with GWU right now. Um, Pair, one of the things that I've found when I try to use participatory approaches and, and simulations in teaching is that the most important aspect is that individual participants who violently disagree with each other, come from very different backgrounds, have very different biases, learn to speak respectfully uh -huh. to each other um, within um, what is essentially a safe environment that's created, that's created in, the, in the course, right. in the classroom. Um, what they also learn to do is to think outside the box in terms of looking at the kinds of political, geographic, ethnic, religious factors, gender factors that often don't come up in policy discussions. In fact, they're very carefully avoided. So I just wondered if and how you deal with those kinds of cultural factors. Mm -hmm. well, okay. but, but, it, but it seems to me that what you mentioned are advantages of doing it that way. Uh, now, if you're saying that they become less tolerant of each other, but you said they became more tolerant, which is my experience as well. But I think what's so good about it is they actually think about the causal links among these various things or between one thing and the other. The analytical capability is strengthened. So the, the, I, don't, I didn't detect any negative uh, in what you said, what, what you what you what you describe is exactly what I have observed as well, mm. and I think that's part of what participatory approaches will do. So I agree with you. 
uh, Peer, when we had, uh, Shengyang could speak to that, and Ashok, uh, when we had these dragon and elephant dialogues between China and um, India, um, uh, culture um, and the approach, uh, the, cu the cultural underpinnings of the approach to policy analysis played a significant role of comparing um, the um, um, campaign society with the debate society, uh, China and India, uh, and uh, uh, using very different uh, mechanisms to, to solve policy problems. So, uh, as you just were in uh, South Asia and in China, did you sense a, a, a different treatment of uh, driving the case studies towards uh, problem solutions? That's a very Essentially good. Essentially, a follow-up question to the yeah, culture question. It's a very good. It's a very good question. Yes, there, there was there was quite a difference between the South Asia group and the uh, East and Southeast Asia group in in the way they approached this. Absolutely, I think the South Asian groups were much more used to a lot of deliberation, a lot of discussion, taking into account a number of other positions. Whereas in East and Southeast Asia, particularly some of the participants from China were, were less kind of focused on those things. It was more, look, if this is the best way to do it, why don't we just do it that way? It, oh. But I don't want to overstate that because those were small samples. I mean, we're talking about less than 25 people in each case, and, and generalizing from that may be a little risky. Mm -hmm. Which brings us to Suresh. Suresh, uh, you give us your comments? Uh, thank you, Joachim. Thank you, Pear, for a very nice uh, presentation. And I'm glad to see the case studies come in the form of a book uh, that we started working from IFPRI as well. Um, I want to address uh, uh, the, the two issues that uh, Joachim said I should address. To start with the open university approach. Mm -hmm. Now, we are calling it as open curriculum learning initiative, but the ideas are same, but we are focusing more on how to get the content to the professors. And that's what you are doing as well. And why should we do that? And I, exactly to address the question that you uh, uh, raised. Uh, and Klaus and I talked about that. Professors, uh, to, in order to earn little extra income, because which, which they need, have to go out and do consultancies. In the process, in the past 15, 20 years, uh, teaching has suffered in universities. If we give them a ready-made kind of content that they can use in the form of slides, in, in the form of case studies, other teaching materials, and we call it now reusable learning objects, where they can take it, mix and match, with not necessarily in a course rigid structure, but they can use it in any course. Take one case study from market failures in Malawi in a course uh, in agriculture marketing, not necessarily a food policy course. Right. So that is the approach that we have taken, as you know, in the, in the, in the open learning initiative that, that we are working on. So we are using this content that you have created in the 60 case studies as an example of uh, how to mix and match uh -huh. content to create new curriculum. Uh, maybe uh, cut this into three courses, small courses that can be offered uh, in undergraduate, graduate courses. So that's coming. So we are going to use this as a demonstrative kind of a course. Uh, we are using all your cases as what we call reusable learning objects with uh, meta uh, data attached to it. And we are just adding a learning objective to each one of the uh, case study and learning outcome so that uh, professors can know what after, I mean, you probably have defined that already in your courses when you teach, what uh, students will actually learn after going through this case, for example. Um, that's that's uh, coming, uh, Joachim, so we'll, we'll, uh, you will see the live uh, AgroQuery portal where this will be done uh, in July that we are working very hard on building uh, right now. Uh, that's one aspect of it. The second aspect of impact assessment, it's, uh, that's something that we have been doing at IFPRI. Uh, now we have, uh, but if, at least I can sh uh, tell what we do from uh, looking at the curriculum impact assessment. We have the list of or the databases of the courses that are offered in U Europe, US, and in major developing country universities where food policy courses are taught, or content of food policy are taught as part of the courses. And we have the database of the professors. So when a new material comes out of IFPRI uh, publication, we look at which one of these courses can use that material. So we, we directly go to the professor and say, look, it has come up. Uh, we encourage you to use that. And then we download the co curriculum of this professor next semester and see whether it is entered. So you will see a lot of courses that are offered in global 
uh, food problems courses, world agriculture courses, uh, that our content, if free content is already there. That's one way to look at our impact. How many pros, professors in developing countries, for example, have actually taken and used that case studies in their courses uh, in terms of impact assessment? We can go back in a in, 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 in few years and do that. Uh, the other way to do that is, uh, one other way to do is trace the students that you, you have taken uh, courses with you uh, in developing countries and whether see whether they have become social entrepreneurs, so to speak, uh, or policy entrepreneurs, and how analytical they are in addressing the questions uh, independently or as part of the government system and so on. And that takes a little bit of uh, tracing to do, networking to do, but uh, it's not easy if you keep track of few of the students who have shown uh, large interest in this approach. Uh, that's something that we can think about. But I also wanted to talk about how can we create new case studies by the students who are already in the field in developing countries mm -hmm. trying to address the problem. You use graduate students, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, something that we are trying to figure out in, in agro-curie work <coughs> is can we use students and professors in combinations? Um, when they do a master's thesis, can a new case emerge uh, that, that can add value to the content that we already have. That's something that we are trying to experiment with. And we are going one step further to do that in extension system as well. Uh, but we can, we can experiment that in the, in, the, in the food policy arena so that we can uh, bring cases from the ground, from Bangladesh, for example, an NGO trying to solve a problem. Uh, and how do we bring that NGO program manager to write a case, for example? Mm -hmm. uh, case, let me stop it. Yeah. Any reaction to this, uh, including the, maybe the last point? And Sure. The, 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 um, I think all the 10 cases that are currently being prepared are prepared by people in developing countries. About half of them who participated in the workshops, they're not students, they are actually instructors. So, yeah, absolutely, to the extent. What we try to do in Tanzania, in, in the Tanzania program consists of students from Cornell and students from the medical uh, college, medical university in Moshi in Tanzania, and they're going to do case studies, uh, and and if those case studies are up to the standard, we'll use them. So it, we absolutely, if we can, the more we can do on that, the better. On the impact assessment, I think the issue for us is: Are we going to measure output that we can do? Are we going to measure outcome? That's not impossible. Are we going to measure impact? That's my problem. And that was kind of my answer to Joachim. I don't, I don't know how to measure impact. I don't know how to get the data. Hmm. Uh, if we can do it, let's do it. Well, uh, there we have a nice challenge. Uh, uh, I think I would measure uh, by checking whether they got a job and make money uh, relative uh, to the counterfactuals who who didn't read uh, Pierce cases and were not trained and motivated by them. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, uh, if we know how to do that, randomize design, uh, and uh, uh, if we can do that with nutrition programs, why not with uh, case study education programs? So, um, but I think the next generation has to do that because uh, it will take a little while um, so that they are fully trained and all externalities have kicked in. Um, and uh, the great new crop of, uh, of agricultural uh, policy and economic scholars is, uh, is growing and, and uh, changes the world. So did you hear that, Emily, you're the next generation? <laughs> <laughs> Pear and I uh, met today because Pear is a, a World Food Prize laureate um, at the event in the State Department where the next laureate was uh, um, made public. Uh, well, uh, Gebisa Ejeta from Ethiopia is the next World Food Prize laureate, $250,000. Uh, Hillary Clinton announced him. and. Um, uh, I think it's a wonderful choice. Um, a poor boy, uh, village, uh, Ethiopia, uh, uh, walked to school, uh, uh, later by bus, uh, came home uh, at the weekends only, um, and uh, focused on his education. Actually, it was uh, made clear that it was his mother who focused. Um, and uh, he ended up um, uh, developing sorghum hybrids resistant to drought and, and striga. Uh, 
striker week, which is so devastating. Um, I think, uh, Pierre, the, the speeches which we have listened today uh, in, uh, in the State Department, uh, both from the Secretary of State and uh, Secretary of Agriculture, uh, and then uh, at a little luncheon thereafter with uh, leadership from State Department, AID, were unheard of in this town for 30 years. Hmm. The intensity and the focus on agriculture, fighting hunger, food security, um, is, uh, is really great. And um, one of the seven points which uh, Secretary of State Clinton made uh, uh, directly addressed the roles of universities and higher education. Uh, so uh, I think um, there's some good news and uh, I'm happy to share it on this afternoon.